Welcome back to the GSMC Sports Podcast for our final segment here. We are going to be talking some college basketball. This weekend we had some big games, but also we had the college basketball selection committee for the tournament get together and they gave their seeds for the top 16 teams in the country. So got some interesting conversation points to come out of that, including one that did not age very well whatsoever. But important note that this was a decision based off of their resumes as of Saturday afternoon. They did this at 1230. So we had some events that directly came after it that definitely sparked some conversation in the college basketball community. So we will get into all of that. And the, again, just final note here, this isn't a projection of how the rest rest of the season will play out, but this was how things were as it stood on Saturday afternoon. So that being said, they gave Purdue as the number one overall seed in the upcoming tournament. UConn, Houston, and Arizona rounded out the rest of the one seeds. And really, there was immediate debate here about UConn versus Purdue. UConn has been the number one seed for the past handful of weeks. As far as the AP poll, they'd been number one ranked. But Purdue technically had a better resume going into it. They had more Quadrant 1 wins going into Saturday. Immediately after that, UConn played Marquette, who Marquette ranked number 4 in the AP poll. The selection committee had them as a 2 seed. They, The Huskies play Marquette at home and absolutely demolish them. They won by 28 points. That was, according to ESPN, that was the largest margin of victory between two top five teams in a conference matchup in the AP poll history. So it was just a, an absolute, I, I, I got to stay, uh, stay PG here as far as my language, but they, they kicked some behind, I guess you could say in the most PG way possible, but um, a massive statement win for them. You have to imagine a little bit that seeing that that game took place right after the committee did this exercise on national TV, of course, that they used that as a little bit of motivation as far as them saying, well, they don't think we're the best team in the country. Let's show them. This is, of course, the defending champions in the Huskies. So a massive statement win from there from them there just about has to be the best win in the country this season in my opinion then you have Sunday take place where Purdue lost to an unranked Ohio State team that actually fired their head coach on Wednesday we're playing under an interim head coach and this was their first game since then so now as far as resume and all of that UConn is now 9-2 and two versus Quad 1. This actually counts as a Quad 1 win for Purdue as well, interestingly enough, because on the road in Ohio State just cracked enough of it, I suppose. We'll see how long that sort of holds up, but they are 9-3 and three in Quad 1. So we are going to talk some big picture stuff here with UConn, but before we do, just some thoughts on Purdue and this loss. It's clear from the online reactions, and we've talked about this in past episodes, about the reputation that they have. The nation and college basketball fans just, they don't trust Purdue with their recent bad losses in the tournament over the past few years. Obviously now they have lost two double-digit seeds in each of the past three tournaments, last year being the worst one yet, being upset as a one seed to the 16 seeded fairly Dickinson. So they don't, the nation doesn't really have a lot of faith in the Boilermakers and I don't blame them either. Purdue has now lost three games this season, all of which have come to unranked, unranked teams on the road. So 
it's they've won the game the big games they've showed up to those and they've looked good in those but it's again you just don't have a feeling that there's they're not capable of getting upset once again we also a statistic that we've talked about in the past is the historic rate that these top 10 teams are losing on the road to unranked opponents and following this loss for Purdue they are now 37 and 37 to unranked teams so they were briefly above 500 they are now back down to 500 exactly so that's improved since the last time we've touched on this subject but still very interesting that we are seeing these top ranked teams lose as many games as they are to these unranked opponents it just goes to show the the madness that we are in for i guess no pun in intended but a little bit as well that we are due for come march when this all sort of plays out so in this game specifically it was purdue's offense getting really stale down the stretch um ohio state they didn't let any easy entry passes get into ed they forced some of these other players to play around the perimeter and sort of work their way into their pack defense and the supporting cast i think for purdue is definitely better than they were last season but you know it's still very ed reliant and starting lineup reliant because they get just such little support coming off of the bench for them they are not very deep at all and i think that, that is a big concern from them they are now officially as the rankings came out just before we started the show they are officially number three houston has surpassed them for that number two now i don't know it's hard to say it's an overreaction because it's only one spot and houston is a great team but again purdue still has the more impressive wins within the first two quadrants in comparison to a houston but everybody i feel like myself included and you know sure the experts necessarily don't feel all that way as like themselves but i think that this is definitely a concerning look for purdue headed into the tournament so if the committee was to go through the exercise today i think there's no doubt uconn would be the number one overall seed again you're arguing about very little but that is sort of my case for that now how likely is it that uconn repeats as the national champs they are currently the betting favorites they are plus 450 on fanduel when i checked before the show it's interesting because they're actually off to a better overall start this year than they were last year and last year they came out even hotter at the very beginning of the season but then sort of fell into a little bit of a struggle you know mid through the season they are playing UConn now are playing a tremendous game of basketball obviously you know capitalizing on that win against Marquette and it's interesting to see how Dan Hurley has sort of kept this program afloat here after losing three of their most impactful guys to the NBA during the draft Jordan Hawkins Adama Sanogo and Andre Jackson Donovan Klingon who came in as a freshman from Connecticut was definitely a very interesting prospect and like the idea of him coming into UConn at the time you know it seemed like he was sort of vying for minutes behind a very impactful Sanogo obviously and he probably could have entered into the draft and been maybe a late first round pick last year but he decides to come back to stores i think is where yukon is located and he's been great for them just filling the role exactly how he needs to he is a defensive anchor in the paint and then he's a great screener and roller on the offensive side of the ball so Again, he's maybe not quite as consistent of a scorer as Sonogo was. Sonogo just put up big numbers for them. But I think that he's still a very interesting draft prospect. Could definitely be a lottery pick this year. And as far as this season goes, he he's, looks a lot more mature in terms of the knowledge and understanding what he needs to do 
when he is out there on the court. Tristan Newton is another name that obviously has improved a ton, taking on a larger role for this season. He's been the facilitator, the playmaker for them, and he is their second leading scorer. Their leading scorer, interestingly enough, is now Cam Spencer. This is a guy that transferred in from Rutgers last season, and he is one of the best shooters in the country, one of the best players in his conference, and I think that, you know, definitely has the experience um, as a fifth-year player and is ready for a bigger role on a more impactful team that he's been on in past seasons. Stefan Castle has been great for them as well. His development over the course of the year has been a very positive thing for them, both currently and for him in terms of the people that were high for him, high on him, I should say, in terms of the NBA draft. His shooting and his his efficiency has definitely seen a bump over the past couple months and the decisiveness I think is also something that really stands out now than as it than it did early in the year coming off of the injury and you can just see coming off that injury as well he looks a lot more athletic now as well I think he's a very good prospect for the NBA and I think they have a great shot at doing this repeat obviously it's never easy in March Madness to you know in these one and done situations be able to bring it game in game out but I think that they have more depth than a lot of teams do in the country. I think that they have the star power. They have a very well-rounded offense as well. I don't think that they're too reliant on any one player in particular. Obviously, Newton ru runs and initiates a lot of the offense for them, but you have those moments with Castle where you know he's been in and out of the starting lineup, but he can definitely lead the charge as well. And then you just have consistency. Like Klingon is consistent. Cam Spencer is consistent. And I think that they have a great shot at running it back. As of right now, I think that my other top contenders up there would be UNC. I know they've been struggling a little bit after that Duke game, but I still have a lot of faith in them. I think that their defense is elite and they can definitely um, get themselves together. Houston, like I talked about as well, an incredible team this year. Um, and Baylor is another team as well that I have a ton of fun watching. I think that Baylor's deep. I think that I, during the beginning of the year, I watched them more so for their freshman prospects in Eves Misi and uh, Jacoby Walter. But it's been some of the other guys, none bridges that have really stood out to me as impact guys as well um ray j so all these guys i think are very impressive and i think could also make a run at this thing in march madness as well last couple thoughts here just on some sort of other things i mean i didn't want to harp too much on the committee's decisions because there is still a lot of time left in the season this wasn't projections we will definitely be sure to get back around to some of this seeding stuff as the year goes on but Kentucky's a team that I've had a ton of interest in this year because of the amount of NBA prospects that they have on their roster. They had a stretch from late January into last week, last Saturday, where they had lost four of six games. They gave up 91.3 points per game in those losses. Even when I first talked about Kentucky, defense is sort of immediately where you have to go to with that conversation. Um, and John Calipari has been very heavily criticized because of the performance of this team as of late. But a couple big wins for them this week against conference opponents. You They beat Ole Miss at home and then actually went on the road to knock off number 13 Auburn. Auburn was a four seed according to the selection committee as of Saturday. And they did a really good job on that defensive side of the ball where they held Ole Miss to 63, Auburn to 59 in those wins. If this team, I don't consider them to be a real contender, but I would like to see them make a run. I feel like we've been a little bit short on, you know, top tier NBA prospects getting their March Madness moments. The Kentucky Wildcats, I think, have a chance to go on at least a little bit of a run, but going to have to, you know, level their game up on the defensive side of the ball first before that happens. 
and we saw it at least this past week let's see how long they can actually sustain this for and then finally uh rick patino had some incredibly interesting comments after their loss to seton hall he killed his team talking about how they're not athletic enough their lateral quickness specifically they referenced on a couple times he even dropped one of the names of his players in particular about you know being a good effort guy but not athletic enough not able to move uh quickly enough laterally he said it, it's been two months trying to get his guys to make bounce passes and it was he i mean he really did kill them he said it's not the job itself it's the team that he currently has so really like you don't see coaches really go after their players as much as uh patino did in this instance but you know they started the season pretty well and they are two and eight in their last 10 games and it's just just wild stuff i really do recommend you go look at the clips of that because it was a very interesting moment again never really see that um anymore in modern day sports you had kyle parry saying blame me don't blame my players and then patino on the other end it's like my, my guys just aren't good enough so that is all we have for today thank you very much for tuning in we will be back tomorrow two o'clock uh thank you to the gsmc sports network for allowing us to host this show and we will see you tomorrow let's go i wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow feel like it's gonna be a bad day yeah, i'm tired of shit and the coffee ain't hit yet damn ain't that great